Good to see everybody out tonight. I want to bring you a message tonight from uh, the book of James. Just uh, one verse of scripture, James chapter 1, verse 18. Um, as you turn to James, a couple of leading candidates for who exactly is the author of this book. We're mindful that one of the, the main James in the New Testament is James, whose brother was John. They were fishermen, uh, and their father's name was Zebedee. And Jesus called and said, uh, Come, and I'll make you fishers again. And we think of James. Um, and he's definitely one of the main James in, in the New Testament. However, we know about James, the brother of John. Acts chapter 2, verse 12 says, Without any a duplicity or anything of the sort. Acts chapter two, uh, chapter 12 verse 2 says, James, the brother of John, was put to death with the sword. So he is not, he's not a possibility, for example, for what happens in Acts 15, where we find there was a, a conference in Jerusalem that the Apostle Paul even attended to try to receive a <coughs> heavenly instruction on, on the doctrine of circumcision. And whether, uh, whether Christians should require uh, folks to be circumcised. And that may sound, may not be strange to us, but for them it's very much important. So important the Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem and find out. But at that conference in Acts 15, uh, Peter spoke, and then James stood up and gave the verdict, really, for what, what rule they took back to the church. So that leaves the question if it's not James, the brother of John, well, which, which James is it? And history teaches us that uh, Jesus, as we know from Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 3, uh, he talks about Jesus and his siblings. And we, we know now a lot of folks, the Catholic Church, my understanding is they reject that teaching. And they say that uh, Jesus was uh, uh, born of a virgin and she stayed a virgin until the day she died. That's my understanding of what they teach. But that's just not what the Bible says. And if you have a Catholic church history in the Bible, they go hand in hand. You, you just always believe the Bible, okay? Because uh, let God be true and every man be a liar. Uh, so uh, the Bible says in Mark 6, verse 3, that Jesus had siblings. We know they didn't share the same father, but they did have the same mother. He would have brothers. And he was identified as the carpenter's son in Mark 6, verse 3. And also some of his siblings were named, enumerated, and one of those was James. So James' is church history teaches us, I'm talking about a Christian church history period, teaches that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the, the one who spoke at the conference in Acts 15, and he's the one who wrote this epistle over near the end of the New Testament. So uh, that's, that's really interesting to me anyway. When you consider as he starts this letter in James 1, and he, he could have said, he could have said, James, who wore the hand-me-down clothes of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> he could have said that. If you ever had an older sibling, you know what hand-me-down clothes are. And no doubt that all his siblings would have worn the same clothes that he wore. But James didn't say that. James said exactly what a a servant should say, James said, uh, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners, and the only hope we have is in the grace of God. And it wouldn't matter if Jesus was your half-brother. You're only saved through His obedience and your obedience to God's Word. It's on what? So James speaks of, we believe this to be, for that reason, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, and in chapter 1, verse 18, uh, James writes this. He says, He chose, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we are so thankful that you counted us worthy to accept your grace, to obey your words, and be part of your church. May we be found faithful to each of us that we will be servants 
of the Lord Jesus Christ who reigns at your right hand tonight. Thank you for his life, for his obedience, his faithfulness, his uh, steadfastness to do your will, and the victory that he accomplished over sin and over the grave. Thank you for Jesus. We pray your continued blessings on this body here at East Point. May you be glorified through us. We ask you for increase. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> James 1.18 says, He chose. He would be God. Would he look at God the Father or Jesus Christ who was part of the Godhead? The word Trinity, as I mentioned in Wednesday night Bible study, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The biblical word is Godhead. And we know from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, God said in verse 26, Let us make man our own image. That's plurality. Elohim in the Hebrew. That uh, God was there, but yet it was, it was plural. The Godhead. Moreover, we know Jesus was there in the beginning, at the beginning of time. Preacher, how do you know that? Well, uh, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without Him, John chapter 1, verse 3, without Him, the Word that was with God in the beginning, and was God in the beginning, without Him was not anything made that has been made. So He was there in the beginning. Uh, Paul says the exact same things in different words in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, he made everything in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, and powers, and rules, and authorities. That's Colossians 1, verse 15. So Christ is there. He, whether you're talking about the God, the God the Father, or Christ, the Son of God, He chose. That's who He is, the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, the creator of the world, the author of life. Um, he chose. It's not an accident. It was God's divine will and plan and purpose. He knew what was going to happen when he put Adam and Eve uh, in that garden. The garden of Eden. He knew what they were going to do. And the Bible teaches us over Revelation that Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And as pretty as Eden would be. Uh, and uh, we can only imagine that, that utopic state, state of perfection. Maybe the weather was perfect. The little Bible says that there was no rain. Rain hadn't fallen from the sky. Instead, the water was, uh, the earth was watered as it came up from the ground. And as you imagine that garden as pretty as you can see it in your mind, and you look just over the horizon as the sun's coming up or going down, and maybe you can see a cross over on the hill in the distance. Jesus Christ, I don't know that you could literally see that. The Bible doesn't say that. But the Bible does say that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The plan and the purpose was accomplished. God knew from the beginning. That he knew. And because of that, he, he, he chose. E Ephesians chapter 1, uh, chapter 2 rather. I'm sorry, Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 5 says, He He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. It was his choice. But God chose us. And you say, man, why would he choose people like us? We're all a bunch of misfits. You see, at Christmas time, and the story nails, what is it, nails, and a whole bunch of the misfits. That's us. I said, man, the, the Davis family has a reunion and you just know that there must be a carnival out there running by itself somewhere. You know? <laughs> uh, that's, that's, why, uh, that's why the church is, really. Uh, who here is not saved by the... Anybody here is saved is saved by the grace of God, right? Okay. That's the only shot we got. And although we're all a bunch of beggars, at the same time, God chose us. Well, why would He do that? Why? Only one explanation. Because He loves us. Just because. John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, and again in verse 16, the Bible says God is love. It's the only reason. It's the only explanation. So that's who he is. That's what he did. He chose, the next phrase says, to give us birth. Maybe the most famous conversation in the entire Bible happens uh, as it's recorded in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, you have a leader 
of the Jewish uh, religion. He was a, he was a teacher. Uh, he also had faith in Christ and he helped bury the body of Christ after Jesus died at Calvary. But his name, John chapter 3, is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, this learned scholar of the Jewish people, he comes to Jesus at night. Now, a lot of speculation why would he come at night? It seems that the most obvious explanation is it wasn't safe to come in the daytime. I mean, this Nazarene uh, crowd stopper, uh, Nicodemus wanted to see him, but he really didn't want everybody else to know that he wanted to see Jesus, you see? Uh, possibly that's exactly what it was. As the darkness fell over the city and the shadows began to appear, or the shadows rather began to disappear, and darkness came on the city, out of the darkness, Nicodemus scurries through the streets because he feels a little bit of safety in the dark. Nonetheless, he comes to Jesus, John chapter 3, and he asks him this all-important question. Um, he asks Jesus, what, how can man, how can man be born again? And Jesus really puts him in his place. Uh, you know what Nicodemus said in John 3, verse 2? He said, Rabbi, as he talks to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with you. And he sizes Jesus up. He knows that Jesus is doing exactly what we study all the time. We mentioned this morning. He's opening the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, and the tongues of the mute, calming the storm, and raising the dead. There was no explanation. Just like you would want to see if that's real. I'm just telling somebody, I heard the Davises say, you have to Google it. They say that the state record Black Baron, Virginia, was hit by a van this past weekend. Anybody hear that? Now, we heard it 700 pounds. Y'all think how big it was? 700 pounds, that's a big I was at a church again in Eastern North Carolina, and these guys were telling me that, uh, yeah, we got a lot, of, we got a lot of bears out here. You like to hunt? Yeah, we got a lot of bears out here. So, dude, yeah, but the state record in North Carolina bear was killed out here. It was, yeah, almost 800 pounds. Oh God, yeah, man, that's big. I know black bears don't get that big. So I thought. <laughs> so I, I pull out my phone. I get away from you guys. I'm checking it out. They tell me the truth. It was a state record black bear I killed out there. It was a monster. But uh, it's a... Uh, man, I got sidetracked on birds. I kind of got lost. <laughs> yeah. That's, when, when, you, when you hear something, you want to investigate for yourself. You want to see for yourself if that, that's true. And you see, we, we know from John's Gospel, in the Gospel of John chapter 9, there was a man that Jesus opened his eyes and the Pharisees call that man in and they interrogate him. They say, uh, uh, were you born blind? He said, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I was born blind. Well, how, how did you see? Well, this man came and, uh, and he tells what happened. And, and then they say, well, now, now, back up a minute. How did he do it? He said, I've already told you. It's John chapter 9. It's a whole chapter. He said, I already told you once. Well, if I tell you again, will you become a follower of this man, a follower of him? And then they were like, are you going to teach us you were born in sin? You get out of here. But they cut him out of the synagogue. John chapter 9. But that shows us that they were, they were looking. They were looking for an explanation. What, was he really born blind? They, they wanted to call his parents in. His parents, they did call me in John chapter 9. And they say, they say yes, this is our son. He, yes, he was born blind. But how he can see now, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. They were afraid themselves of being cut out of the synagogue. But when you see that process, exactly what you would think. And when you hear somebody's opening eyes of the blind and raising the dead, healing the cripples, say, Man, I don't know about that. Let me, let me check over here on Google and make sure that's real. And they do all the steps that you would think they would do. And Nicodemus, it seems, had made that same conclusion. John 3, verse 2. He told Jesus... No one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. And to, in response to that, Jesus in this famous conversation in John 3, John 3 verse 3, he said, I tell you the truth. It's ain't time for chit-chat. Not to mention Nicodemus and his VIP status and his good intentions nor his academic credentials. Jesus just tells him, I tell you the truth. 
No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now Nicodemus is, is confused by that. He says, how, how can a man be born again? Can I enter a second time into my mother's womb? And Jesus embarrasses him to a degree. He says, you're a teacher in Israel and you don't know the basics. Well, let me ask you, can you enter a second time into your mother's womb to be born again? Do your head like this right here. That's the way it works. But yet this idea of a duo, a new start, that, that you messed up and you made a mess of it and, and you get to start all over. That's a good thing, right? Um, I, I, I mentioned before, like golf, if you golf, you go to tee up and you, you hit one this way or that way and if you're playing with a bunch of good old country boys, we'll say, we're going to take a mulligan. That means we'll just pretend that shot never happened and we'll start all over. If you're doing any carpentry around me, we'll take a brand new board or something. We're going to measure it, mismeasure it, cut it in the wrong place. If I have to throw that board away, we'll get a new board. And start all over again. Try it one more time. It's good to have a brand new start, you know. Um, engineering professor down at the University of Kentucky, before we graduate, he said, boys, you need to build two homes. In your lifetime, you need to build two homes. So you build the first one the way that you think you want it, and you build the second one to fix all the mistakes you made the first one build. I don't know if that's his advice or what, or just his own experience or what, but that's, that's what he told us. It's something refreshing about a new start. And that's what God gives us. In our own lives, we've made our own mistakes, failures, sin, the things we've done our own way. We each went our own way, and we've each made a mess of things ourselves. But yet God's willing to give us a new birth. He chose, God Almighty, chose His will, His plan, to give us new birth. Next phrase, James chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, through the word of truth. Now, as Jesus prayed, as Jesus prayed before he went to Calvary, it's recorded in John chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus prayed and he said, Father, sanctify them, my followers, those who have obeyed your word, sanctify them by the truth, your word is. He is truth. And that's the way I remind you how it ties together as I have before. If you remember John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So He is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Father, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. Well, how can Jesus be the truth and the word of God be the truth? Only one way. In the beginning, say it again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God. See how it fits together. Uh, he is the truth. And, and the truth of the matter is, uh, this world is a fallen world. From that garden in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve done things their own way. And if you could, if you could talk to them, have that conversation, say, Eve, for heaven's sake, don't do it. And man, if you eat that fruit, it's going it's, it's to just be a mess. I mean, it's going to go downhill. Your kids end up killing each other. I mean, it's going to be disaster. It all hinges on you eating that fruit. Eating. Don't do it. And she just looked back and said, I've got this under control. You can't tell me what to do. That fruit looks real good. Haven't we all made decisions just like that? And who, who can throw the first stone at eat? Not one of us. Since Genesis chapter 3, it's been a fallen world we live in. And the word of truth, the word of God says, Romans 3 verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, Romans 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18 says, the soul that sins shall surely die. Now whose fault is it? It'd be easy. In our world today, man, I tell you, there's a lot of things going on wrong in the world. There's a lot of places you can stick the blame. But I'm just going to tell you what the world says today, it ain't my fault. It might be your fault. In fact, I think most of you all to blame. But as far as me, it ain't my fault. That's what the world says, right? Nothing's ever your fault when you hear the news. But the Bible says, the word of truth says, in James 1, verse 14, 15, it says, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
See, that's the truth of the matter is we've all sinned. And sin requires death. Because that's, that's, the, that's the result of sin. When it's full grown, it brings death. The wages, what you get paid, your compensation for sin, starts with D, ends with F. It's, it's death. That's what it is. The Bible teaches us. That because of God's goodness, because of His love, because of the faithfulness of Christ, He came once for all, Jesus did, to pay the price for sin. And as God had defined through the law of Moses over in the Old Testament, some people would say, man, that's an obsolete part of the Bible. Man, we don't we need that Old Testament anymore. That's the God of the Old Testament. Yeah, fair enough. He's the same God though in the New Testament. Yeah. And it actually, when you study the Old and the New Testament, if you want a full understanding of the New Testament, you need to study the Old Testament. And what God had said and established in the Old Testament is that sin requires blood. I've gone over that hundreds of times, but guess what? On this Sunday night in December, it's still true. What does sin require, church? Blood. Sin requires blood. That's what God described. It's what He defined. Sin requires blood. And He said, He set the stage and all the thousands of multitudes when Solomon built the temple, there were 120,000 um, 120, lamb and goats. Is that what it says? Sheep and goats? Look it up, W. What does it say? It's over in the book of Chronicles. Somewhere. Y'all got about 36 chapters. It's, it's 120,000 sacrifices when he dedicated the temple. It was tremendous. Multitudes of, of animals were killed to teach that one truth. Hebrews 9, 22. The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. But Hebrews 10, verse 4 says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So out of 400 years of silence, as I mentioned this morning in the sermon, 400 years after the Old Testament comes to a close, God speaks in perhaps the most powerful of ways. Born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Born of woman. Just like God said through, uh, He said, God said to Satan in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and her, between your offspring, devil, and her offspring. Born of a woman, born under the law. Christ came and He overcame sin and temptation. 1 Peter 2, 22. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in His mouth. You and I have said dirty words. You and I have been Christians for a long time. I mean, we, well, we don't say dirty words anymore. No, but we still think about it sometimes. Don't we? Surely don't make me feel bad. I ain't the only one thought about saying something bad sometimes. See, the longer you've been a Christian, it's not that we're struggling with sin that we're doing anymore. It's, it's really what you're thinking about. It. It's between our ears. We're the biggest problem we got. Is it not? We're, we're struggling with, with lust. We're struggling with controlling our anger. Well, yeah, well, everybody has that impulse to just punch the guy in the mouth. But that's, that's not the Christ thing to do, you know. So, so it's what we struggle with. See, it's, it's sin. Um, Jesus came and, and He overcame. No deceit was found in his mouth. Nobody could prove him guilty of sin. Before he suffered at Calvary, he said, and I believe a powerful way, the Greek word is nikio, which means to conquer. And the Bible says in English, in John 16, 33, he says, be of good cheer, I have nikio, the world. I've overcome the world, conquered. Man, if I was going to make a shoe company, I'd use that nikio as a root word, and I'd just call it, I don't know, Nike. <laughs> That's where Nike comes from. That's what it means from the Greek word, Nikio. It means to conquer. That's, where, that's what it comes from. That's the word Jesus used. The New Testament was recorded in Greek. Nikio, I have Nikio, the world. He overcame. He's victorious. He's the Lord of all. The Son of God conquered sin, raised from the dead. Psalm 100, verse 1 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Woo! He chose. To give us birth, a second chance, new start through the word of truth. The crazy thing about it is if, if, if we're willing to step out on faith and believe, as I mentioned this morning, the, the, the calendar 
is based on the existence of Jesus Christ. This is, you know, some people say, what's this obsolete story y'all believe, you narrow-minded people? Uh, faith is a crutch that you lean on to get through life. In this obsolete story, you believe, you believe in a, a virgin birth and somebody can actually raise from the dead physically. The calendar. I was born in 1982, A.D. Angle Domini. The calendar is based on the existence of Jesus Christ. When they signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, they didn't put the words Jesus Christ in the document, but yet they dated it in July, whenever, September 17th, whenever they signed it, 1776, in the year of our Lord. Jesus Christ is undeniable. Uh, there's literally more proof that Jesus Christ lived and died than there is that George Washington lived. And he's on every corner you go. His mother shot. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's not, it is an obsolete story, sort of, as some would say. But yet we're standing all these years later on the Word of God. It's the only explanation. Of all the people who voluntarily laid their lives down, and it wasn't just like, well, allegedly a group of people saw him after he rose from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, there is one encounter at least where he appeared to 500 people at the same time. Now that would be a mass hallucination. Psychologists, in fact, say that's impossible. There's no such thing as a mass hallucination. But yet Jesus appeared to 500 people on one encounter. There's more evidence. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. It's not just a crazy story. It actually stands the test of time. It's here today. It is the word of God. And it's up for us whether we're going to choose to believe it, choose to obey it, and live for his glory or not. It's a choice we make. But what he offers us is truly in every way a new life. As far as our sin goes and our past goes, the Bible says... Uh, it is about a rebirth, just like Jesus said in John 3, verse 3. I tell you the truth, you must be born again. It's where you believe what you've heard. You believe what you've heard, you accept it. You make the confession with your mouth, you repent of your sins, and you're buried with Christ. In a watery grave of baptism, the Bible says in Acts 22, verse 16, Arise, and this is the doctor, mind you, that the man who wrote half the books in the New Testament, this is what he received. Because that's who this verse was spoken to. Man and I spoke it. Luke recorded it. And it was to a guy whose name was Saul from Tarsus. You know him as the Apostle Paul. And he was told, get up. Uh, be baptized and wash your sins away. Calling on his name. It's this incredible thing. And Jesus died in their place. They pierced his side at the cross. Out came blood and water. And through obedience to the Word of God, you can be buried in water. When the Bible says, Romans 6, we're buried with Him through baptism, so that spiritually, you contact, through obedience to the Word of God, you contact the blood of Jesus Christ. Water can't take away your sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ will save your soul. Amen. It's through the Word of truth. It's not logic, in a way. It's, it's not what people are going to accept, at least anymore in this sophisticated world we live in. But yet it's still the Word of God, and it still pleases God through the foolishness of preaching, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, to save those who believe. Amen. And that's me, and that's you, and that's everybody else. James 1, verse 18 says, He chose to give us birth through the Word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. A lot of times when we talk about first fruits, we'll go back to the harvest times in the Old Testament. And we'll talk about, for example, tithing. That was a way to give God what was first. The first fruit, uh, I know firsthand in a watermelon field when it gets ripe, uh, the first picking is the ripest ones you got. And they go back to that same field and pick many times, even though they may be bigger, this ain't gonna be as sweet as they were on that first cut. I tell you right now. <coughs> uh, that's just the way it is. That first fruit, that's that's the best ones. And what you do for tithing, you would you would give God what comes in first out of your field. Whether it was, it was your best, it was your first, and you're you're taking that to the the house.
house of God, you're going to give that to him. In the Old Testament, it's what the temple was. And you would trust that to God. And that makes it, to, it's a visual statement. That you trust God, is, the rest of the crop will come in. God will bless your fields. The harvest, God will give you health and strength to get through it. But you're going to give Him what's first because you're going to put Him first. You're going to make it most important. We think of tithing a lot of times when we think of first fruits. But in this verse, that's not the context. It says He chose to give us birth. God chose to give us birth, second chance, through the Word of Truth, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. See, God has made us to be in Christ brand new. And that, that's what He wants. He wants for us to be upside down, Romans 6, verse 17 and 18. Uh, thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. God wants us to do what's right. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to love Him first and secondly love our neighbors or sin. But He wants us to be so um, different, so Christ-centered, Christ-focused, Spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-filled. The Bible says, Ephesians 4, verse 22 through 24, you were taught, church, Christians, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your mind, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. See, God makes us, he, he desires that we would be made brand new. That we would be so, maybe the word is radical. A radical in service to the king, a radical uh, in service to the Lord who saved your soul. That you're going to make an impact in those you contact. You know, if, if, if we just offer to the community, uh, here at East Point, uh, come down to East Point, we'd love to have you. Uh, what other church you can go to here? Then, then we would just be one of several dozen. And in a way, yeah, we're, we're another church, fair enough. But, but I, I, for one, have to believe that uh, we're teaching and preaching New Testament doctrine that they just can't find on every other street corner and every other church that they attend. Uh, we believe in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. We believe in the New Testament pattern of salvation. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, believing, repenting, confessing, being buried with Christ in baptism. Being baptized is not the first thing that a Christian does. It's the last thing that a sinner does. Because that's what carries you into Christ. It makes a big difference. Uh, we believe that we're teaching, preaching, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We're not the only Christians. We're going to be Christians only. And that makes a difference. Well, I believe we've got the real McCoy. So as we go out in the world, if we go with excitement, we go with some fervor, then we're really taking this thing really. It's going to make a difference. And with all the love of my heart, if, if for you, Christ is not worth following, if you can't sit down with somebody and tell them what Christ has done for you, or what Christ is doing for you, or how God is still at work in your life, then maybe that's because for you, Christ is just not worth following. It's, you, you just attend service sometimes. And sometimes read a book, call the Bible, and sometimes sing a song. But when you think about what God is doing in my life, well, I mean, really nothing. What's He really saying to me? I, I don't hear Him saying anything. The preacher talks a lot. Uh, you, you see, if God's not worth following, then. Who's, who's going to want what you got? Nobody. But if God is worth following, just act like it. That's how we plant water with joy. If we can't grow the church, God can. We're going to plant, we're going to water, we're going to do that with joy. Just because God loves us, we love Him for it. It was uh, Brother John Powell, one of the first times he ever prayed in, in church here at East Point. And it was something to the effect in his prayer, he said, uh, something to the effect, he said, said, Lord, help us to be so excited that we don't have to ask people to come to these points and they'll just see what we got and they'll follow us to get here just because they want to get some of it too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I, that's, what, that's what it should be about. That's, that's the New Testament Christianity turned the Roman Empire.
Empire. By 3 400 AD, the Roman Empire was declared Christianity was the state religion in Rome. It was because these people were radical. They were different. They were Christ centered. And they were sharing the good news. They didn't have a government tax exemption. They didn't have buildings everywhere. They just had a zeal to communicate the Word of God and let God work in their lives. And that's all me. That's all things. We just got to be a little more Christ centered. I remind you one last time from the book of James. A half brother of Jesus, he said, God chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And that's what matters. Tonight, uh, as we prepare to sing our invitation,